specific topic. So uh, we're going to start with yeast in specific. Um, so yeast, as some of you may or may not know, is a single celled fungus. Okay, so it's actually all around you. It's on your skin. It's on the outside of grapes. It is kind of just one of those things that naturally exists in our environment uh, that we don't think a lot about until, you know, oh, we have a big jug of grape juice, you know, and then suddenly it's turned into a jug of wine. You know, like how did that even happen? Uh, so really it's just kind of the magic of yeast um, working on the product uh, to turn it into something new and different. So um, in our case, you know, we're specifically focused on how yeast can make bread into bread, right? So um, yeast turns something that would normally be like a cracker or what we would consider like an unleavened bread, like a lavash, um, into a big fluffy loaf of bread um, that's squishy, has a nice chewy texture to it sometimes, um, and basically is what we know as bread, okay? Um, so these things have not always been around. They're not something that um, uh, humankind has always been adept at making. So. Um, this really kind of came about uh, in like the Egyptian times, we believe. It was about uh, 4,000 ish years ago. They um, only know this because Egyptians were such wonderful record keepers. Uh, as most of you know, they had the pyramids, they had um, hieroglyphics on the wall, they had, you know, all their um, scribes would keep excellent records for history. Um, so they have found um paintings that basically depict what a um ancient bakery sort of setup kind of looked like which is very cool for us so um please reference back to that uh the powerpoint that i'll post alongside of this video um so that you can see kind of what i'm talking about so um the first bread type product that they have found um dates back about four thousand years ago like i said um and it was found in a tomb so um, that's kind of interesting. Um, obviously it was used, but maybe it wasn't used to its fullest potential, right? I mean, maybe people kind of knew, um, okay, this is happening whenever we leave a loaf of dough out, but, um, they didn't really know how to work with that. They didn't know how to control it. They didn't know, you know, why it was happening. Well, what was happening in, in their, de in their dough? Um, so eventually, you know, uh, humanity progresses, we get new inventions. Um, that big invention that kind of changed the world uh, of bread was uh, the microscope, right? So in the microscope, we could see the uh, actual microbes of fungus, right? So we could see what does a um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae actually look like. How does it behave? When does it die? When does it, when is it really active? When is it slow? Um, so how can we manipulate that to our benefit? Um, and how can we make that into new things for humans to eat and drink and enjoy, right? Um, so hold on, uh, let me make sure that I stay close to my PowerPoint. Um, so, it's important to remember that uh, yeast is a fungus. It's a uh, single celled. Okay. Uh, so the one that we especially deal with is this strain of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay. Um, there are many other types of, of yeast out there, so many, um, but this is really the only one that we would use here um, at, for food production, okay? So you may see uh, items labeled as baker's yeast or brewer's yeast. Um, they're really one in the same. Um, they're not, uh, there are, you know, different strains of that type, um, but for the most part, they're all kind of about the same. Um, you may see in the store something called nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is like a, it's a flake type of yeast product, but basically um, it's, it's inactive. 
Um, it's no longer alive and basically it's just kind of used for flavoring purposes um, and some for some nutrients that it may provide. Um, you may find that uh, in like a nutritional aisle, um, sometimes the bulk goods aisle of maybe your HEB. Um, and also, uh, what else do we use it for? Vegans use it uh, to kind of uh, add, add some flavor to different uh, goods. It kind of adds like a, a depth or a richness of flavor, uh, adds some like umami type flavor, uh, which is can sometimes be difficult to uh, add to a dish when you're following a strict vegan diet. So uh, that's something to uh, remember. Um, all right, so what types of yeast are available? There's, uh, for the most part, three types. So there, uh, we've got uh, fresh, active dry, and instant. So fresh yeast has the shortest shelf life. So it is essentially yeast that has only been slowed down. Okay, so it is yeast that is still alive. It is not in a dormant state. It is still alive, still kind of eating and going through all metabolic processes. It's just going through in a very slow way because it has to be refrigerated. Okay, so yeast when it is cold is very slow. Um, so this is uh, basically yeast that is, uh, it's alive, um, it's packed in a starch, okay, so what I mean by that is that the yeast uh, is made into a sort of a slurry uh, with some starch type product uh, where uh, later on, all, as much moisture as possible is removed so that basically the yeast has something to eat while it's sitting uh, in your pantry, you know, waiting for you to, to eat it. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say pantry, in your refrigerator, uh, waiting for you to, to eat it or use it. Um, it does have a short shelf life. It has the shortest shelf life of all the yeast. Um, short shelf life. Um, this is added directly into your recipe. There is no need to um, activate it or saturate it, hydrate it with water first. Um, it can just go directly into uh, the, the dough that you're making. Okay. Um, so this one is not, we'll say directly into product. Um, active dry. Active dry is pretty common. Active dry you will see uh, in your local uh, grocery store where they um, have all the baking stuff. Um, they're, they sell it in little packets, usually like one gram packets or quarter uh, teaspoon packets, something like that. Um, that is yeast that has been basically um, dried uh, and completely uh, put into like a dormant state where uh, the yeast has to be uh, awakened. So when you add water back to it um, and you give it a little bit of food, which would be your sugar, um, that wakes it up and gives it something to eat and makes it active again, okay? Um, the last option uh, is your instant yeast, okay? So um, this one, is also, also can be added directly to food. To your product. Um, this one um, needs rehydration. Um, 
this one and this one, these are both um, shelf stable. Uh, they last about a year. Um, this one only lasts about two weeks. Ah, weeks. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So let me get something to wipe this off with. Do -do. Okay, so yeast has a very low tolerance for uh, changes in temperature. Um, at high temperatures, it kills your yeast. And a high temperature for yeast is really not all that high, especially with the temperatures that we normally deal with in the kitchen. Um, it's somewhere between 120 and 130 degrees. Um, that's not very hot at all, you know, when you think about it. So it's very easy to add, you know, maybe uh, water that's too hot out of the tap um, into a measuring cup, uh, pour your yeast in there. That yeast doesn't do anything, right? Um, if it just sits there, it never um, makes any foam, it never makes any movement, no bubbles happen. Um, likely that that yeast, number one, is too old, or number two has been uh, killed in some way, okay? Um, so it's very important that uh, you watch your, your temperatures. You want it to be warm so that the process doesn't take forever, but at the same time, we need it to just not be too hot, okay? 90 degrees is great, okay? Uh, that's nice temperature controlled water. Um, what else? So, um, when you rehydrate the yeast, this would be for active dry only. The other two, it's not necessary, right? Uh, so, when you rehydrate your yeast, you are um, effectively taking off all that starch that um, has kind of been like protecting the yeast all this time um, and kind of freeing it up to uh, resume its metabolic state. So um, it starts waking up and it starts getting hungry. Okay. Um, to help it along, you can take a little pinch of the sugar that you have set aside for your recipe you can sprinkle it over the, the water mixture that you've got, just a little bit, not a lot. Um, and that can kind of give the yeast something to eat, right? So if the yeast are eating, they're moving more quickly and it moves the process along a little bit. Um, so this is with warm water, uh, plus a little sugar. So the temperature range that uh, yeast has is relatively narrow. Um, like I just said, above 120, um, yeast is starting to die off. Um, so you wanna really control your uh, temperature throughout the entire process. Um, it is also possible to kill your yeast um, in the hot box, right? So uh, turning your hot box um, or proof box uh, up to say 120, just because you're trying to accelerate the process along, um, oftentimes does the opposite. So number one, you end up killing your yeast um, because that's basically uh, what you're doing is you're, you're no longer proofing, you're starting to bake it. Um, so what happens is your, your yeast dies, number one, and then also number two, what happens is that on the outside of your bread, you kind of end up with um, a dryish crust um, and then whenever you commit that to the oven, 
um, and it's trying to, you know, get the oven so it gets the oven rise also with the steam. Um, it really can't rise the way that it needs to because the outside has already formed sort of a crust because you have essentially made it too hot and you've um, kind of dried out and baked the outside of it already prematurely, right? Um, so in low temperatures, yeast is not dead, but is what we call dormant. So if you freeze your bread, Um, after what we call the first shaping. So you um, mix your, bre your bread dough together. Um, you've got your dry ingredients, you've got your, your wet ingredient with the um, dissolved yeast in it, right? Um, we just mix the two of them together, wet into dry. Uh, this is what we call the, the straight dough method. Um, it's the simplest one there is. Uh, you mix that all together. Um, you knead it until it's ready. Um, and then, you know, basically we, uh, we ferment, we let that sit in a, in a proof box until it, uh, doubles in size. So, um, basically that is what every time we're fermenting, what we're looking for is doubling in size. Um, we never know how long that's going to take. So please don't go by numbers. Don't go by a specific time. Um, depending on how active your yeast is, the temperature of your dough, the temperature of your hot box, and all thing, other things also, um, how much sugar is in it, how much salt is in it, if there's chlorine in your water. There's all these different things that can affect how rapidly or slowly your yeast is going to develop, right? So for that reason, we just kind of have to look for what it looks like, right? Um, has If it started out this big and it got to this big, it's doubled, okay? That's what you're specifically looking for is doubling each time that you um, have a, a ferment period. Um, usually there's two. Um, so after the first ferment that you have where um, it's nice and doubled in size, basically you're going to take that dough ball, you are going to portion it out into however uh, size portions you, you make. Always, always, always weigh them out. Um, it is almost impossible to eyeball it and end up with uh, rolls that are all the same size or loaves that are all the same size. Um, loaves normally are like uh, by pounds, maybe a one pound or a two pound loaf. Um, a dinner roll is usually about one and a half ounce uh, portion uh, and then you shape it, right? So um, whenever we portion out all of our dough, um, and then we, we shape, right? So you make, you make the little dough ball that will eventually rise into a dinner roll, okay? Um, at that point, you can stop the process, not before and not after, right then. That is where you can stop the process. Um, you can take all of these dough balls that you've made, they can go into the freezer, okay? Um, you may have seen this in um, pre-made bread that you can buy at the store. Um, they have frozen bread where basically you have to defrost it, uh, let it rise in like a warm place. Um, you can make a proof box out of anything. It can be, um, you know, a warm windowsill or um, in a, the trunk of your car, um, really anywhere where it's uh, just kind of not going to be disturbed. Uh, it's going to be um, slightly warm, slightly humid, and that way uh, your bread has the best chance of, of rising, right? Um, the colder the room is, the slower it's going to go, okay? Um, it would almost be impossible for you to uh, to have it too hot, you know, in, in a normal house. So, um, so um, your, your bread balls that you have or loaves or whatever that you have portioned out, um, they can be frozen um, and then you can come back to them at a later time, okay? Um, by coming back to them at a later time, basically you take out, um, you know, half of the labor involved in producing bread. Um, oftentimes when staff comes in very early in the morning, they only have, you know, a few hours to get out a lot of production. So that's the reason for, um, you know, basically doing the prep work ahead of time, having stuff ready in the freezer, and then, you know, we, we go straight into the next portion, which would be um, take those frozen dough balls out or whatever you've made, um, allow them to defrost, uh, put them in the proof box until they double, 
bam, right into the oven, right? Um, that way they come out nice and fresh. You've got freshly made bread, but it didn't take you, you know, say four hours to get that accomplished, right? Um, and that's how we manage our, um, our labor during, uh, in, a, in a scratch made bakery. Um, so freezing your bud, it will um, stop the yeast um, from multiplying. Um, they're moving very, very slowly. Okay. Um, when they're in the proof box, they uh, are very happy. This is like them being on vacation. They are living their best life. They are reproducing like crazy. Um, they are just having a party, okay? Um, so this is uh, optimal temperature is about 90 degrees. Um, going hotter than that, like I said, you run the risk of uh, kind of drying them out. Um, this is the most rapid. Rapid movement. Once they go into the oven, um, they are killed. So you are never eating uh, a live yeast. That doesn't happen. Okay. All right, so let's wipe this off. Okay, so let's talk about uh, midterm. Uh, midterm will be written now uh, instead of written and practical. There's no way that we can possibly do a practical lab at this point. Um, I can't ask you to make stuff at home and take pictures or send it in or anything like that. Um, there's just really no accountability in that way. Um, so basically what we'll do is we're just gonna give the same midterm that we always do. Uh, or that I always do. Um, and uh, you will complete it through Blackboard. So there will be a link for that this week. I'll just give you like a few extra days uh, to get that done. Um, because I know that everyone is kind of, you know, reacclimating themselves uh, to going back to school. Uh, so I didn't feel like that was the friendliest way to invite y'all back, but it is necessary. So um, midterm is comprehensive. So. So look to your homework. Um, a lot of your questions are gonna come from homework questions. Um, also big things that we've talked about. So the methods, um, when things go wrong with the methods, all the things that we've talked about in lab, things that you've practiced in lab, um, all of those things would be the major points to hit um, on a midterm, okay? Um, I'm not really the type to um, ask a bunch of, you know, trick questions for things that, you know, we didn't really talk about or things that, um, or just uh, a little point in the margin or something like that. Um, focus on the big stuff, okay? Um, those are gonna be, you know, where the bulk of the points is gonna come from, okay? Um, there is a multiple choice, course, some short answer, true, false, matching, um, probably not matching. Um, it's, it's a little bit harder to put it into the uh, blackboard, but it might still be in there. Um, I'm basically taking an old test and uh, retrofitting it into, into a blackboard. So um, do, do, um, let's see. Um, it'll be posted by, so it'll be posted by Monday. Um, we're going to try to put this up as soon as possible. Um, 
I think that you guys will do fine. I'm not really worried about um, the, the midterm all that much at all. Um, if you look here in the, in the background, that's my dog. She's laying right there. She looks like there's a cow laying on the floor. That's my dog. <laughs> I just see glimpses of her feet like every now and then. So, um, yeah, I don't don't stress out too much about the midterm, but do do study. Um, it is going to be necessary that you start study. Um, also, one important point: the test will be timed, so um, you will have one hour. So when you open the test. Um, make sure that you are able to complete the entire test at that one time. Um, make sure that you know you're not you won't have interruptions or I don't know uh, your favorite show is gonna come on Netflix, whatever. <laughs> um, you're you're gonna have to uh, make sure that all of it happens uh, at that one time. You will not be able to re-enter the test. Okay, um, I'm asking for all of you to do this honestly, um, not to share answers or. Uh, to you know refer to notes while um, you are there um, normally in this type of situation we would do proctored exams at the testing center obviously that's not an option so um, that's it for today um, please you know check back throughout the week um, all of our communications are gonna have to happen through blackboard um, from here on out you know until we are able to come back so uh, fingers crossed um, we'll actually see each other in person soon. So y'all take care. Bye.